This is Corporate Warrior, high-intensity training lifestyle and business with Lawrence Neal, helping you improve your health and physique, become a great personal trainer, and start and grow your hit business. Lawrence Neal here, and welcome back to CorporateWarrior.co. My guest today is James Fisher, PhD. James is a course leader and senior lecturer in sports conditioning and fitness at the Southampton Solent University in the UK. He is regarded as one of the leading researchers in exercise science and in particular resistance training. James, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me back, Lawrence. Uh, it's my pleasure. And um, I, I wanted to obviously spend uh, the majority of this episode with you to talk about your latest thoughts with regard to optimizing muscle hypertrophy. Um, I think the, 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 the listeners are due a hypertrophy update from you, James, and obviously wanted to go through the um, table, which uh, Brett Contreras recently shared on Instagram and is kind of doing the rounds and love your, your views on that. Uh, but before we get into that, I just wanted to learn, like, how did you first get into high intensity strength training? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I did my undergraduate degree under a uh, or undergraduate dissertation supervised by a Dr. Dave Smith, who I've since published a few papers with. And Dave was just an absolute font of knowledge and, and the best way to describe him. And I, I love describing him this way. And I love to describe anybody this way if they are so was inspirational. And um, I love, you know, it sounds really cliche, but I love to be around people that know and that are inspiring to, to work with. Um, and I was talking to Dave. Dave is a psychologist, actually, um, Dr. Dave Smith, and he now works at Manchester Met University. He's a sports psych. And he um, we were talking about training one day and talking about lifting weights. And, and um, he said, have I read a book uh, called The Lumbar Spine, The Cervical Spine and the Knee by a guy called Arthur Jones? Um, and that he had got some he had ordered some copies to be in the library. And I said, oh, I've not seen it, but I'll have a look. And I went and picked it up and had a look through it. And it seemed to be this book on medical training and testing and things like that. And I was a bit like, oh, OK. But then as I, as I read through it, it just it all seemed to apply to strength training in general. And then I met with Dave again, you know, partway through reading this. And he said, oh, when you're done with that, you should read Ellington Darden's new high intensity training. And at the time, as, as an undergrad, I was just searching for everything I could read on this area. And I read uh, I started reading the, the new high intensity training and it seemed to be a bit easier to read and a bit more exciting to read than Arthur's work. So I, I dived straight into that, uh, dove straight into that, I should say. And um, and I can remember, I can still remember to the day the, the page where he talks about, uh, you know, proper set of bicep curls or barbell curls. And that with most people, you should drop the weight by about 50 percent and and how you're feeling with a strict form of bicep curls. So I can remember thinking, oh, OK, is this is this really the case? And going into the gym and, re and really thinking about form and technique uh, and going to the point of muscle failure. And, and after sort of trying it out, realized that really my training had never been that intense. Um, and, and I think that. I'd always worked hard in the gym. Um, I'd always, or I'd normally always trained with a partner. So we did do a lot of forced reps and things like that, but we probably often came in a bit too early and we probably technique probably broke down a bit more than it should have and things like that. Um, and it became, um, the more I read, I, I then started reading more, obviously finished that book, went back to Arthur Jones and found ArthurJonesExercise.com and started reading everything I could then. And, um, and it, and it also became quite easy to apply because I was playing basketball at the time through my undergrad. And I simply didn't have the time or the energy with my undergraduate studies, with working as a personal trainer, with working a bar job and with coaching and playing basketball uh, with different respective teams. Uh, so the idea of spending kind of um, 20 to 40 minutes in the gym uh, once or twice a week was far more appealing than, you know, two hours maybe or up to two hours, you know, two or three times a week. And, um, and yeah, and it all kind of went from there. Um, I always laugh about it when I talk about how I got into high intensity training because, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I was your prototypical skinny guy and and then I discovered <laughs> high intensity training and added like 50 pounds of muscle. <laughs> that's, 
that that's that, that's not the case at all. You know, before I did any high intensity training, I was doing uh, dumbbell overhead press with forty kilo dumbbells and and uh, you know a supine dumbbell chest press with. 50 kilo dumbbells for probably a couple of good reps with each of those. Um, and, you know, full sets of eight to 12 with a bit lighter weight. Um, so I was always pretty strong and I was always a pretty big guy uh, in relative terms. Um, <laughs> and I'd spent time trying to really bulk up. You know, I did sort of, uh, it's interesting when I hear people talk about calories and big bulking diets. I did kind of 5,000 calories per day diets where you would kind of snack on a, a pizza uh, kind of thing and, and add in massive meals. And I can remember one summer, me and one of the guys I lived with, um, getting up every morning uh, and, and watching Pumping Iron and having like porridge and dark chocolate and, and you know, loads of espressos before going and lifting weights. <laughs> And, and so on. And, you know, my bench press was up to about 135, maybe 140 kilos, which is about 300 pounds. So a respectable bench press. Um, but, you know, it just was hours and hours in the gym and, and for all of those calories and all that training, very, very little. When you consider that I cut it back down to, you know, a, a small percentage of that and uh, had the same results. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, I, I'm amazed it's taken me this long to ask you that question because I, 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 I thought we'd have covered it in previous episodes. But um, it's interesting because James Steele said the same thing about how Dave Smith inspired him. But I'm guessing that because obviously you know James Smith came to work with you, that probably you played a big role in kind of I hesitate to say the word converting, but inspiring him <laughs> with high intensity strength training like uh, principles. Is that correct? Is that accurate? Uh, yeah. And, and, and yeah, he, I mean, he didn't speak to Dave until probably his undergraduate dissertation or, or his PhD. And, and, it, and certainly I can remember talking to him in my office, in the door, doorway of my office, when he was in his first year and talking about Mike Mentzer and Arthur Jones and telling him to go away and read. And as you know, James is a, uh, it's just a learning machine and um, went away and soaked up everything he could. So, yeah, I would, I, I, you know, he credits it to whoever he, he really believes inspired him but i can definitely remember having those conversations with him about things like the heavy duty text and the arthur jones text and l darden and so forth and um you know put it all in perspective l darden's texts are are great because they really apply the content to the layperson whereas um you know heavy duty 2 is maybe a lot more philosophical um and arthur jones is a bit more antagonistic to read so um, but I can remember James going away and reading uh, Heavy Duty 2 and deciding that he was, you know, an objectivist through and through and he was, you know, <laughs> all over Ayn Rand and, you know, and, and almost having debates with him about, you know, um, you know, some serious philosophy. But, um, yeah, I, you know, I think he probably followed a similar path. I don't think he necessarily made huge gains when he when he you know, moved to high intensity training, but I think he found the simplicity of it and appreciated the abbreviation of it and so forth. So, yeah, I'm always a little bit skeptical when someone tells me they made appreciable gains when they moved to hit just because it's, it could be a, you know, it could be confirmation bias, right? They're looking for more and more uh, evidence or examples of why, you know, hit is the best way to do things. Um, so I wonder if that's a little bit of, delusion on their part um you know i i can honestly say that i don't think i've probably well i actually have no idea because i never measured it properly but um yeah. if i have gained muscle since moving to doing high intensity training is it's very very s small amount um so yeah i'm just do you do do you agree with that do you think do you are you always kind of skeptical if someone's been doing you know traditional resistance training multi-set fill in the blank for say five plus years and then they move to hit that the chance of them actually gaining anything appreciable and attributing that to hit is probably unlikely. What do you think? Uh, I, I have mixed feelings on it. I think that, um, yes, I think for the most part, probably yes. But I think that some people's training, if you follow like a flex magazine or, or whatever workout, 
then you are probably overtraining to such a great degree and you're probably placing such little emphasis on technique or intensity that you really have reached a point where you're going through the motions, lots of motions, um, and actually moving to something that's far more abbreviated uh, gives your body more recovery and gives your um, and, and also increases the intensity. So actually provides a far more appropriate stimulus for growth. So I think that there could be something in it, but I also think, you know, yeah, I think there's a lot of confirmation bias in that. I also, you know, it's difficult because would you, would people have made the set, you know, if we take it at face value that people did make incredible gains from high intensity training after doing high volume training beforehand, would they have made the same gains if they hadn't done the high volume training beforehand? So there's almost like this periodization approach of, well, if you do a lot and then cut it back, then your body can can adapt now that it's getting more recovery. Mm. Yeah, so interesting. I, so I don't think you can ever really take a, 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 you know, ever really know, if I'm honest. It's kind of a case by case basis yeah, as well as understanding someone's history and uh, yeah, their own genetic predisposition and so on and so forth. And other lifestyle factors, their sleep, yeah. their nutrition, their other stresses, money, you know, family, friends, partners, so on and so forth. So, you know, yeah. Mm. And, and where they are in their life with their hormones and things like that. So, mm. yeah, I think it's really difficult to ever, ever have a clear answer on that. Cool. So i um, very excited to dig into this table with you uh, from Brett, which is a really a nice table, actually. And it's called Evidence-Based Training Guidelines for Hypertrophy. It's become very popular on the interwebs. Um, and uh, I read this and I some of it I agree with, some of it I had real problems with, and I don't like the way it's worded. I don't think it's precise enough in the wording. Um, okay. And I, I'm just very keen to run through it with you to get your perspective so do you have that up in front of you now i do indeed yeah just opened cool. it up cool so you've got the first line there training a muscle group and i'll, I'll obviously link this in the show notes guys if you need a reference uh, so it says frequency training a muscle group two times a week is better than one times a week there isn't much evidence to support or in support of training more often than that except to split up volume when specializing so i read that and i thought well is that really true based on the research? Because it's my understanding that, and we've talked about this before, that, you know, so long as you're training to muscular failure, that there doesn't seem to be much difference between once and twice a week. So what's your thoughts on that, firstly? Um, yeah, so this is interesting. So uh, if we go straight, if we go to the, the academic research, I think that it probably supports that there's no difference between once and twice a week per muscle group. Um, and I think that that's, that's done. Um, I think there is some research that supports twice a week and some research that supports that there's no difference, uh, which, if I'm honest, I would then lean towards training twice per week. So I actually don't have a problem with that as a statement. I think frequency, what he's, what Brett's written, training a muscle twice per week is better than once per week. I think you, I don't think there are many people that need more than a week's recovery um or more than three or four days recovery and I, and I also think that there are other benefits to training twice a week and I know you said you want to stick solely with hypertrophy <laughs> not with the other benefits but I would say from the point of view of, of raising your metabolism from the point of view of um you know mental focus and things like that um if somebody can afford to do two workouts per week I would always encourage training twice per week if they can so I, I'm going to go against the literature here and say right now, I think that there's enough literature in my mind that supports twice per week. And whilst the bulk of literature supports once per week, uh, yeah, I would still, I would still stick with, I'm afraid I would stick with Brett on this and say twice per week. But but kind of what you're saying there, it sounds like you know from a hypertrophy perspective, again ignoring the other benefits, which I completely agree with, mm -hmm. um, is that well, there's no there's it's no worse doing once a week versus twice a week in in your opinion when it comes to our muscle hypertrophy. Um, so if we are time pressed, then once a week is probably still going to provide the same results if we're not willing to to do twice a week. Yeah, I think the problem with this is that you then come back to the other fact 
factors. So if you do enough exercises once per week and provide enough stimulus to the other mus to the muscles. So if, for example, we take um, uh, I don't know a, a pressing a pressing motion. If you do a leg press once per week, does that provide enough stimulus to the quadriceps to make it grow as much as if you trained a leg press twice per week? Um, well, pro- I- I- in my opinion, probably not. But if you did a leg press and the knee extension and a lunge for for the sake of those exercises once per week in one workout, then I would think that that would be better than just a leg press once per week. So I think that, you know, the idea of frequency has to be factored in with volume. Um, if you now said to me, is it better to do uh, five exercises twice per week or 10 exercises once per week? I would say five exercises twice per week. Why? Um, because I think that there's, I think that there's something in repeated um, stimulus. I think that, um, I mean, ultimately what we're trying to achieve with this is muscle protein synthesis. And I think that the, the training is providing the stimulus for muscle protein synthesis. I, I think that if you think about it in, in terms of a curve, you provide a stimulus in the, in the case of a workout, uh, you prompt growth, the curve goes up. Uh, over the days, over the successive days, the curve comes back down um, and so forth. And I don't think anybody's curve goes up high enough and comes back down shallow enough that they only need to train once per week. Uh, It might do with more training in that single session. But I think that Mm. less work and more effort to create an inflection in that curve um, or a more frequent inflection in that curve is better, in my opinion. Cool. No, I get that. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, we, we, and this will probably come up a number of times during this conversation. And, um, I've been told off for kind of over saying it, but, you know, uh, I think yourself and James both kind of told me about, you know, all roads lead to Rome. In fact, Skylar might have started saying that. I'm not sure who started saying that. Um, but it's kind of a nice way of capturing that, you know, a lot of the evidence shows that, you know, if you do this stuff over a long enough period of time, you're probably going to get what you can in terms of muscle growth. Um, so I'm sure that will come up during this. But um, with regards to that first line on frequency, is it kind of possible or fair to say that, you know, Another reason why twice a week might be better is it might be might get you there faster. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Um, yeah, that might be the case. I, I, I you know, um, I mean, that's difficult to say, isn't it? I, I don't know any studies that have looked at that. You know, an abbreviated workout uh, or a you know abbreviated workout of a longer period or a more intense, a more intense, when I say more intense, more training sessions in a shorter period. Uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, there's certainly no studies I know that have looked at that, and I can't ima- and I can't imagine that any research would be able to cover that because even if it was up to like 24 weeks, you're probably looking at such a short time, uh, uh, such a, a relatively short time scale that um, you probably wouldn't see much difference. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the next line is volume, and I know that these are these two are very closely related. Uh, and it, it says ten to twenty sets per week per muscle is ideal based on individual recovery. Some evidence suggests you can go higher for short periods of time, especially if specialising. So, do you agree with that line in terms of the overall volume? Per week? Ten, to tw- ten to twenty sets per week per muscle is is is, a, is, is in my mind a lot. Right. Uh, I think if you if a muscle is stimulated ten times per week, which was which was the findings from Brad's meta analysis a few uh, last year maybe or the year before, uh, that I think that's probably uh, the top end of sufficient. Um, you know, if you think about, I mean, you've done a discover strength workout, so if you think about ten or twelve exercises. Uh, done done once or twice a week. Let's say you do overhead press, chest press, uh, lateral raise, so on and so forth. Well, that might be three exercises that stimulate the deltoids. You do that twice a week. That's six sets per per week that stimulate the deltoids. Um, pec fly, overhead press, chest press for the pecs, same thing. Quadriceps, same sort of thing. You know, so I think that probably five to ten sets is is certainly 
sufficient. Um, I think, you know, I mean, 20 sets per week per muscle group is a lot. You know, that's either 20, I mean, let's put this in context. That's either 20 sets of bicep curls, um, with no, uh, compound movement, uh, or 10 sets of bicep curls and 10 sets of pull downs, or what, seven sets of bicep curls, seven sets of pull downs, and seven sets of seated row. Um, you know, if you then divide that over two workouts, which is what the frequency comment says, you're looking at three to four sets. So that's just a multiple set. I think that really the math there just says that's just a multiple set approach. And I don't tend to agree with that. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking there's so in that particular line regarding volume, um, there's quite a lot of assumptions baked into it, right? As you know, that you're doing multiple sets, that you're not necessarily going to failure on every single one of those sets. And that changes the context quite significantly, doesn't it? When you're looking at one, a single set of failure, um, you, 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 you look at like volume is, is it, it changes the game quite a bit. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I definitely think so. I think that once people train to, to, to a muscular failure, it's a true muscular failure. And I'm going to use the words true muscular failure because there were some comments on the Facebook thread that I would tend to agree with that a lot of studies say muscular failure. And I don't necessarily think that they did, participants did train to muscular failure. Um, I think that once you apply that in, in honesty, yes, I think the volume becomes a, a, a very different factor. Um, so yeah, I don't. I think twenty sets is you know way too much. Yeah, okay. I think ten. Set, I think ten sets is certainly an upper limit. Yeah, cool. And, and I would say that I would say that Brad's that if I'm honest, if that's based on Brad's uh, meta analysis, I would say that's a bit of misinterpretation because Brad's paper suggested that ten sets per muscle group was sufficient. Right, not okay. was not was the lower end of the threshold. <laughs> Yeah, I remember it being ten sets. So yeah, I was I was surprised it was ten to twenty on there. Um, yeah. And just just for those listening, uh, I want to make sure I say this now that there are lots of questions submitted, and I really really appreciate that. And I'm sure James, well, I could tell James was very grateful because he was getting all excited about the questions. Um, and we will be addressing that in a part two, uh, and it will literally be completely focused on those questions. So we will get to that, but in this one, we're primarily focused on this particular table. Um, Okay, cool. So let's move on to effort. Now, this is interesting. So it said most sets should be carried out close to muscular failure, but reaching actual failure is not necessary and can be counterproductive, not kept in check. See, I just can't, I don't like the way that's worded because it's too ambiguous. So what does that mean if not kept in check? Um, that's why, that's where I have a problem with this, some of the stuff in this table. So what, what, what are your thoughts on that particular line? Well, it's on Instagram, isn't it? You know, I don't know. What, <laughs> you know, this isn't, this isn't published in a peer-reviewed journal article. Otherwise, I that would, otherwise something like that wouldn't exist. So, yeah, I agree. And, and there's obviously going to be be ambiguity in anything that's put on social media in that format. Um, most that should be carried out as muscular failure. I don't have a problem with that as a statement. Should it say all sets should be carried out to muscular failure? Uh, I think that would probably be better. But if we say most sets, then that mean that probably means that a muscle or muscle group is exercised to the point of muscular failure at some point in a workout. So let's, for example, say that at three o'clock when we get off the, the Skype call, I go down and do a workout and I do a set of um, squats. But because it's a back squat, uh, I don't go to muscular failure. But after that, I then do a set of knee extensions to muscular failure and a set of leg curls to muscular failure. Well, arguably, I haven't met the true high intensity training, you know, gospel of training to failure with my back squat. But my quads were taken to failure with knee extensions and my hamstrings were taken to failure with my leg curl. So can the term most sets should be carried out to muscular failure? Yeah, I think that that's probably fair. Um, and and if it allows people to add in more volume, if they want to add in more volume, then, you know, I don't have a huge problem with that. If somebody said, well, I can't do, I want to do 12 exercises because I want to train my calves and my tibialis anterior and my neck and my biceps and triceps and forearm flexes. 
but I can't do that if I take every other exercise to the point of complete failure, then I would say, well, yeah, why not do a set of pull downs or pull ups and then do a set of pull over to failure, a set of bicep curls to failure, a set of forearm flexes to failure. And there you go. You can add in more volume, do the workout that you want to do, but you didn't have to take that first exercise to failure. Yeah. Um, but what he what he's saying here is he's actually it's quite explicit. It says you know sets should be carried close to muscular failure, but actually he says that actual failure is not ideal. It's not necessary. It can be counterproductive. He, well, he's saying it's not necessary. So he says, but reaching actual failure is not necessary. So he's saying as long as we get close to it, then that's fine. And I think that there, mm. I think that what we have to accept is there is probably a threshold, um, and. My argument has has been and will always be that there is likely to be a threshold um, and we don't know where that threshold is. So that so if you can do 100 reps, that threshold could be rep 80 or rep 90 or rep 99. Mm -hmm. But the only true way to know that you hit that rep is to get to 100 reps and fail or 10 reps or whatever it might be. So I think that we have to I would advocate training to failure because that way we know we've crossed the threshold. But is it fair to say that it's not completely necessary? It might be the case. That might be that might be the case. Yeah, nine reps out of ten uh, might be might be sufficient with some exercises. Um, can be counterproductive if not kept in check. Well, that that's just a scapegoat. That's just a get out clause for if somebody wants to train five times a day. Right. And, right. Yeah. And then they train and then they train to failure every day and they don't make any adaptations that they say, well, I was told to train to failure, um, but I, I wasn't told that it could be counterproductive. So I think that, yeah, we've got to remember, it, it, you know, everything is it depends. It depends. It depends. So it depends on sleep. It depends on nutrition. It depends on, you know, other stresses, uh, other factors. It depends on duration. So if you do, you know, like, if I said to you, we're going to do. Uh, 12 weeks of uh, bicep curls to failure, uh, but we're going to train every day, you know, you wouldn't do it. Whereas if I said, you know what, Lawrence, we're going to do four weeks of bicep curls every other day, but we're only going to do it for four weeks. Well, you might hate me for it, but, we, <laughs> but, but, but it certainly isn't the same thing. Depends if you have me doing those barbell drop sets again. Yeah, <laughs> supersetted with um, chin ups. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, supersets a bad word in here, isn't it? I should say pre exhaust, shouldn't I? Is the uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, and I, I appreciate you saying that uh, regarding you know, the, the, you know, the other variables and and also yeah, when he says it may be counterproductive, not kept in check regarding training to failure. Well, you know, that is again the, baked into the assumption that the the, the person reading this uh, and obviously the people who wrote this enjoy training with a high degree, high level, high frequency. Um, and obviously if you're training to failure, you know, like you say, five, six times a week, then that is likely to be counterproductive for most people. Yeah. Yeah. I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. 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 Multiple sets taken to true muscular failure performed at a high frequency, uh, you know, uh, are, are going to be counterproductive at some, at some level. Yeah. Okay. So load. Now this is one I, I completely agree with really. Um, and it's quite nice to see it. Uh, actually in this table and he says all loads build muscle heavier loads require great to training durations and can beat up the joints um and lighter loads can be nauseating so moderate loads tend to be preferred amongst bodybuilders performing a combination of rep ranges might lead to better results so uh, i agree with the vast majority of that um it's nice to see that you know heavy loads and low loads kind of producing the same results is is, is something that is being supported by people like brett so what's your take on that yeah, I mean, I completely, I, I, I agree with that for the most part. I think that the, the common heavier loads require greater training durations, uh, and can beat up the joints. Well, greater training durations, if you take like a five minute rest interval between workouts, or if you're doing a plate loaded machine where you have to, you know, load and unload a barbell or whatever. But I don't think heavier loads require greater training durations. I'd say actually lighter loads require greater training right. durations. Um, you know, I, one of my studies right now, some, some guys this morning in my lab did knee extensions with 80% of one RM, uh, or of maximum force. And they were done in eight or nine reps. And one guy came in and did knee extensions with 40% of maximum force and he did 83 reps. So and, right. <laughs> yeah. It was under tension for over six minutes. Well, that's quite clearly a longer duration. Um, 
So I think that that's in context of what you're doing and rest periods and so forth. Uh, heavier loads can beat up the joints. Well, you know, I think if you're at the point where you're a power lifter or a bodybuilder and we're talking about really, really heavy loads, I mean, hundreds of kilos. Yes, there's probably a degree of truth to that. I think heavy loads, uh, for the most part, I mean, if we say heavy loads, what greater than 80% of one RM? I don't know. Heavier is such a, it's all relative, right? Uh, I don't know that heavy loads are, are necessarily bad for joints. Um, I think moderate loads is again a nice get out of saying, you know, just use a moderate load. Um, it's exactly what we recommended in 2013, uh, you know, in our in our paper loads that can produce around eight to 12 repetitions with a controlled rep duration. Um, but, yeah, I think the idea of performing a combination of rep ranges can be nice. So sometimes use a heavier load, sometimes use a lighter load, sometimes do drop sets, you know, provides that mental stimulus as well. So, yeah, I like that comment. I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I, I also like, like agree with what you say and have an issue with that particular line um, in that, you know, if you're looking at it in a high intensity training context and you're training on machines with really nice strength curves or you're just using great form, you know, smooth turnarounds, then, uh, you know, heavy loads aren't perhaps as problematic as they might be uh, in the way they're described here, to your point. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. Cool. All right. So exercise selection, multi-joint and single-joint exercises both build muscle. Multi-joint moves should be prioritized in training, but single-joint exercises cannot be neglected if seeking maximum muscle growth as they are necessary for building certain muscles and subdivisions. Now, um, having spoken to you about this recently uh, and read some of your research, I it seems to me that single joints are not necessary for optimizing muscle mass and that you know one can achieve their maximum hypertrophy with just multi-joint exercises and obviously if you're talking about preference and things like that that's different so just i guess looking at this in a from a hypertrophy perspective so do you agree with that or or what are your thoughts on that line yeah i think that that's i think that's a fair comment Uh, and multi-joint single joint movements both build muscle that's absolutely true multi-joint moves should be prioritized in training um I, I'm interested as to why that was, because I think it's right from an efficiency point of view, but I don't necessarily think it's right from a um, um, from a hypertrophy point of view. Um, I wonder if the rationale for applying multi-joint moves should be prioritized in training because people can lift more weight. And that's been the old school thinking of why you should do multi-joint movements first. And of course, if you can lift more weight, that goes against the previous comment of heavier loads beat up your joints. So I don't necessarily think that's fair. You know, if you talk to Roger Schwab, and I, and I think that this is a really important point, he would say that pre-exhaustion has the best application by reducing the load that you use for a compound movement. So if you do, um, you know, a, a pec fly, then you would naturally lift a lot less on a bench press. Um, and I think that that probably is is good at a certain point if you're a hardcore bodybuilder lifting a heavy weight. So therefore, I wouldn't prioritize multi-joint movements. If we're saying they're more important to do, and therefore, if you're only going to do one movement, you should do a multi-joint. Well, yeah, I completely agree. Um, Single joint exercises cannot be neglected if seeking maximum muscle growth as they're necessary for building certain muscles or subdivisions. Yeah, so this is, there's a, there's a few papers on this. So there's now two papers from our group with Paolo that have shown marginally higher growth in the biceps as a result of multi joint and single joint exercise. And there was a paper years back by Fonseca who looked at variety of exercise. Um, using things like the deadlift, the lunge, and the back squat and the leg press for growth in the quadriceps. And and groups that trained with different exercises, um, maybe knee extensions was one of them, um, showed better growth across all the muscle groups. So uh, if seeking maximum muscle growth as they're necessary for building certain muscles and subdivisions, well... If you've got the time to do it and you've got the, um, you know, commitment to the, to muscle growth, I, let me put it another way. I still do bicep curls towards the end of the workout. <laughs> okay. I still do bicep curls. I still do knee extensions. 
I still do tricep extensions. Um, I seldom do pec flies. I seldom do lateral raises. Um, and I seldom do any kind of pull down or pull over exercise, even though I absolutely love it. Um, but I think that peripheral muscles in the, in the, in the limbs m- might, there might be something in adding single joint exercises. If there is, it's not much. But if we're talking about truly maximum muscle growth, as the comment says, then there might, there might be something in that. Mm, interesting. Okay. Cool. I'm just also thinking, you know, um, I know that you may not completely agree with, um, I guess, Doug McGuff's prescription in Body by Science, but, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about, you know, I, I moved, so I was doing kind of the big five on machines, you know, all multi joint. And then I, I've been experimenting with his ebbing and flowing of, uh, volume and frequency, but obviously he does it. He, um, does that almost to like an extreme extent in terms of, you know, you'll go through one month where you'll do, let's say, positive failure, big five once a week. And then uh, the next month you'll do once a week again, but it will be um, like a freeway split. And then you're, you're using mostly single joint movements to provide greater recovery um, for muscle groups because then you're only, rather than hitting a muscle fairly directly, um, I guess you could argue in a, in a big five, uh, once a week, you're now only hitting them really directly, providing that sort of direct stimulus once every kind of 21 days, um, which I don't know, maybe you and still think that's perhaps a bit extreme and not necessary for most people. Again, I know it varies, but I just, I wonder if that's for me, that's where single joint seems to have good application when you're trying to provide your body with more recovery. Uh, if you are trying to seek maximum muscle hypertrophy, well, I'm just curious, what's your thoughts on that as a program do you think that's probably a little bit extreme for the most part or do you kind of agree with doug on on his prescription there well going to so so let me get this right sorry it's been a while since i read body by science that's okay going going to single joint movements three times a week in a split routine let me let me let me let me say it again it's a really shit question to be fair so uh in body by science doug and i'm just keen to just address this with you and then we'll get back to the table um but uh doug will doug well, obviously, he's got he's well known for popularizing the Big Five, um, yeah. and then and then uh, he, one of his sort of um, guidelines is to look at your training across an entire year. Uh, and so, what you'll do is say, just for argument's sake, January Big Five to positive failure once a week, and then in February you go to and this is again someone who's perhaps an intermediate to advanced trainee, right? So they've got most of their gains. Um, and then in February, you'll go to, again, still once a week, but a freeway split. So it'd be like, you know, week one, back and biceps. And again, you know, three to five exercises, a mixture of compound and single joint. Week two, legs. Week three, chest, triceps, and shoulders. Okay. Uh, and, and again, you're giving, you're giving muscle groups far more recovery. And then maybe in March you'll go back to a big five with negatives. And the whole point of it is you're providing an ebb and flow throughout the year so as to provide enough recovery for you to continuously improve. Um, because as Doug says in Body by Science, um, or his belief is that you know overtraining is a process, not an event. And so you are kind of pre-planning that. So I'm just curious, do you think that is a, a effective prescription for maximizing hypertrophy or do you think it's just too... It's too infrequent. Well, well, what we're talking about here really is detraining periods, and and I and, and the evidence would yeah. suggest that if you take time away from training a muscle for a short period, you allow the body to re- to recover, and therefore, when you return to training more intent at a higher frequency, uh, training a muscle group at a higher frequency, you allow it to adapt more quickly in that new training time. And the evidence supports exactly that. You know, there's multiple papers that have looked at detraining where you take three weeks off or take a week off every three weeks or something like that. And they show that while you don't grow in that week or in that period, your growth over a prolonged period, say 12 or 24 weeks, is the same as somebody who's had continued training. Um, But it's the same. It's not better. It's not worse. It's the same. So I think that I think that. The key with that is people can not fear taking time away from workouts, but they don't. They are probably aren't going to get a lot more from doing it. So I don't think you're. Go- I don't think you're going to ever get more by decreasing your training volume 
to that extent. You know, the argument of decreasing training frequency so that you can continue making adaptations is, you know, is fantastic in theory. You know, but if that were the case, the strongest people in the world would train once every five years and be, you know, bench pressing buses. And and that doesn't happen. No, but that's that's not obviously that's silly, right? Um and that's why he talks about it like an ebb and flow. So you are you're increasing uh you're kind of increasing and decreasing volume and frequency throughout the year to to ensure that you don't overtrain. And, and, and you're, you're kind of coming in and out of that as opposed to, yeah, like if you are increasing, if decreasing frequency and volume, you know, uh, increasingly over time, then that's just, you know, we know that that's not any more productive and probably, yeah, it just gets a bit ridiculous. Yeah, without wanting to be far too pragmatic over this, doesn't this just happen naturally in people's lives? Like I find right. that some weeks I only get to train once and some weeks I go on holiday and don't train at all. And, and the thing is that I think people need to stop obsessing over all this. Um, I know that that's exactly what this podcast is all about. <laughs> well, part um, of it, part of it. <laughs> but, 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 I, but I think, you know, I, 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 don't get me wrong. D- Doug is one of the single nicest people I've ever met and Body by Science is one of the single greatest books I've ever read. And I, and I would say that to his face. And if he hears this, then, you know, I stand by that. and I look forward to seeing him in March. But um, but I, I do wonder how it would feel to write a book and have people be able to quote it and and cite the workouts <laughs> that you provided. You know, Doug's got a wealth of experience in this, but he would probably also admit he's still on a big learning curve with all of this. Uh, this learning curve is relatively infinite. Um, so I think that, you know, we've got to take a degree of reality with this. Um, you know, the, in my mind, people have a life. And people's lives sometimes interfere with the frequency at which they can train. And what they shouldn't do is think, oh, my God, I haven't trained three times this week or twice this week, or I only got 15 minutes, so I only did chest press and pull downs and leg press. Um, I'm going to lose growth in my biceps. They should just think, that's all I had time to do. And I put in the effort when I was in there. And next week or next month, I'll be able to make up for it because I'm not away on business or I'm not away on vacation and so forth. And so there is... a what, what I would hopefully think is a natural ebb and flow. Um, I don't know that you need to apply it. That, that seems to be dangerously close to periodization to me. <laughs> and there isn't really any evidence around that. So, um, But I think that if people want to plan that, if people uh, plan periods of more frequent training or t- types of training based on when they can and more rest based on when they have to, then I think that's probably a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I think that's a great response. Um, and uh, no, I agree. And it's, uh, yeah, I just, I, I agree. <laughs> I know this is, um, I mean, it's funny because I've done so many podcasts on this subject that I did get a little bit jaded talking about hypertrophy um, because, you know, I, I like talking about all the things related to high intensity training. That's what this podcast is all about, including all, all the business stuff um, and all of the other health benefits and uh, things we should be doing to, to I guess, improve our health. Um, and it is just one part of that. But I thought we would do just a, a conversation about this. And I know that even though it may be overdone, it never gets boring. I mean, you could just tell by the response on social media. <laughs> uh, yeah. People just love talking about this stuff. And, and I do enjoy coming back to it every now and again. Um, but no, really appreciate your view on that. That was really interesting. Um, so just slightly conscious of time and we're about 50% of the way through this table. So let's not <laughs> rush it, but let's crack on. Yeah. Um, Okay, so exercise order. Muscles targeted earlier in the workout will see slightly better gains than muscles targeted later in the workout. So prioritize exercise order according to your preferences. I have no issue with that. I thought that was that was fair. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a load of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think there's any oh. evidence to show that there's Can we great agree on stuff. anything, James? <laughs> I, I just don't think there's any evidence to support that if you do an exercise first in a workout, that it will get that those muscles will have greater growth than if you right. do an exercise last in a workout. Um, there's just there's just nothing that I can think of that supports that at all. Um, you know. 
your performance with the exercise might change. Mm. You know, if you do a set of bicep curls at the start of a workout, you might lift more with the bicep curl there than if you do after 12 exercises, including pull downs and seated row and everything else. But that, I don't think that affects the growth at all. No, nothing yeah. that I know of affects the growth at all. Yeah, I, I mean, I would actually agree with that. And I guess I, I actually um, was thinking about more from a motivational point of view. You know, we've talked about this before, you know, having um, if you're one who struggles to deal with large volumes of exercise, then having your uh, the exercises that you really want to get the most out of at the start of the workout. Um, but you know, whilst that might be better from a performance point of view, you know, as you said there, when it comes to muscle hypertrophy, it probably doesn't matter. No, I don't, I, yeah, I don't think it matters at all. Yeah. Okay, cool. No, I, I, it's interesting when you get into this, it's, uh, you can see where you actually both end up agreeing on things. Um, yes. Okay, so tempo. Okay, so I thought it was a bit of a contradiction, this one. Um, so faster and slower tempos or cadence, I guess you could say, uh, lead to similar levels of muscle growth. But you must control the eccentric phase or the negative phase and not let gravity do it for you. And you can't do super slow reps that last 10 plus seconds. Anywhere from two to six seconds per rep yields similar results, but definitely focus on the muscle while lifting. <clears throat> uh, so, you, you know, this, is, this yeah. is quite a busy one, really, isn't it? So do you want to just give your thoughts on this? Yeah, so so I think that um, you know the argument here is is recruitment. So if you do an explosive concentric repetition, then you probably have very high motor unit recruitment by the explosive nature of it. Uh, if you do a slower tempo repetition, you'll probably reach uh, motor, high motor, high levels of motor unit recruitment uh, towards the end of a set. Um, so there's a fair argument for faster and slower tempos leading to similar levels of muscle growth. Um, must control the eccentric phase, not let gravity do it for you. I would tend to agree with that. Um, that's probably built on the idea that a lot of studies have shown that eccentric phases of exercise do a lot more muscle damage than concentric phases. But I do tend to think we know the body works harder during the concentric phase. So, uh, and we know, you know, muscle activation is higher during the concentric phase. So I would say that that in itself is an argument for more controlled rep durations. Um, the comment then goes to don't do super slow reps that last 10 plus seconds. Um, to me, 10 plus seconds is per phase. So, uh, and I would agree, I wouldn't bother doing that because it gets boring and because uh, you're probably lifting a load that's, so light your muscles are under tension for two plus minutes at which point there's it's likely that your discomfort or nausea kick in before you reach true muscle failure uh but that depends on the person many people can train with a very very slow rep duration um and um you know i mean arguably you could say we'll do one negative pull-up uh for 60 seconds um, with 50 pounds strapped around your waist. And, you know, I would say that that's probably going to do as much for you, if not more than 10 traditional pull-ups. Um, so I don't think you can take tempo as a, as a separate entity to everything else. The comment there, anywhere from two to six seconds per rep yields similar results, but definitely focus on the muscle while lifting. Well, boy, two to six seconds, Let's say that's a relatively controlled rep duration, a two second concentric phase. Um, you know, uh, shout out to, uh, James Biddle and Dave Blakemore, who, uh, tend to say that it's the turnaround that's the most important part and that you, as long as you begin the move, begin the concentric phase slowly, you can then accelerate through it. Um, which might mean that you do a two second phase. Um, and, and I think that's fine. Six seconds is probably better because it's more controlled. Um, but definitely focus on the muscle while lifting. Yeah, boy, we're getting to attentional focus there. So attentional focus talks about whether you should focus intrinsically on the muscle or extrinsically on the weight. Um, uh, I think the jury is all still a bit out on that. But I think the idea of thinking about the muscle rather than moving the load probably helps you keep good form. So yeah. I would I, I would say that's probably a good thing. Uh, I've tr I've trained some visually impaired people, and they uh, of course don't look in a mirror, 
and they don't look at their uh, muscles when they're contracting. They just focus on how it feels. And they generally have very, very good form. Mm. So, interesting. really interesting. Yeah. Is there any, do you think there's any benefits for hypertrophy with regard to accelerating through the positive? You know, like you were saying, um, uh, you know, assuming you've got smooth turnarounds, which are clearly also important, I, I think, for just, you know, reducing the risk of injury. Um, but once you've had those, done those smooth turnarounds, accelerating through the positive, do you think there's any kind of advantage to muscle hypertrophy doing that? Uh, that might be from a, from a most unit point of view. Um, but, but it, but it, yeah, the evidence isn't isn't clear cut on that. Uh, there was a paper a few years back by Dave Beam who talked about Obain, who talked about um, intent being more important than um, actual velocity. So even if you were moving slow, as long as you were trying to move fast, then you would still get the same growth. Um, and that was, of course, at the end of a set when you can't move the weight any faster. Um uh, but I think that might have been more about strength than about hypertrophy. So I, I okay. you know, there's just nothing in that. So, uh, you know, faster and slower tempos, similar muscle growth. Yeah, again, it's vague. Faster, what's faster, what's slower? You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and just in case people missed it, there's a little bit where you cut out where you said um, it it may improve it may improve muscle. Uh, uh, Sorry, motor unit recruitment, um, but the rest of it was really clear. So I'm just just want to clarify that. Um, yes. Cool. Okay. So I guess moving on to uh, rest periods, uh, James. If you want to stop me at any point, because you want to elaborate on anything you've said, uh, just let me know. Um, rest periods. So two to three minutes between sets appears to maximize muscle growth, but you can go by feel and listen to your body. It may be optimal to rest more for big lifts performed early in the workout. So three minutes, for example, and less for smaller lifts performed later in the workout. So 90 seconds, for example. What's your thoughts on this? Uh, if, people are doing mul- if people are doing multiple sets, then, uh, yeah, maybe maybe there's an argument for that kind of rest interval. Um, I don't know that there's really a lot of empirical evidence to support that, that, uh, that statement for rest interval, but I'm kind of past that point of looking at multiple set studies, look, looking at rest periods. Um, uh, if we think of this in concept of exercises, so if you were doing, let's say, a big five workout and you were doing uh, leg press, chest press, seated row, uh, then there might be more to having, you know, a brief rest between exercises. Whether you go as far as three minutes, it's quite extreme. If anybody's ever done a workout where they've stopped for three minutes and just sat there, it feels like a lifetime to me. It does. Um, and that's probably why people are allowed to ask around on their phones and update their Twitter or Instagram or whatever else. Um, but uh, I can imagine from an acute performance point of view, you can probably lift more on certain exercises if you have a longer rest interval. Um, but I don't think it's necessary for muscle growth, and I don't think there's anything to support that that I know of. Um, I know some people want to move through a workout as quick as they can because that's all the time they have. And I know personally some days I do the first exercise and I want to take a minute and, and kind of catch my breath and have a drink of water and then move on. Um, you know, uh, Right now I'm kind of going through a bit of a phase where I tend to do two or three exercises back to back and then take two or three minutes and then do another two or three exercises back to back. So I might do um, a shoulder sequence or a chest sequence or a back sequence, or I might even do kind of supersets, a chest back, or, or let's say an overhead press, a pull down and then a chest press and then take two minutes maybe or a minute maybe. Mm. Yeah, you've, you've spoken on this before and uh, it, it comes down to, you know, from your perspective, from what I understand, that rest periods are totally uh, up to the individual. There's probably no difference uh, when it comes to uh, muscle growth um, reg- regardless of rest period. Like, it, uh, Sorry, it doesn't make any difference what the rest period is when it comes to maximizing muscle growth, essentially. So it's really preference. Yeah, I, yeah and I stand by that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, almost almost at the bottom of this. Um, so training split. Nearly all bodybuilders perform body parts splits. However, all popular splits can be effective for muscle building. 
Total body training has been shown to be equally as effective for hypertrophy as body part splits. Um, I would assume you'd agree with that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting that it says um, uh, nearly all bodybuilders perform body part splits. So that's not that's not uh, a rec- <laughs> that's not a recommendation. That's, yeah. not, that's, that's an observation. <laughs> Uh, what it should say is all popular bodybuilding splits can be as effective for building muscle. Mm-hmm. Total body training has been shown to be equally as effective for hypertrophy. So, you know, yep. it's interesting that they kind of that, – that that in itself to me shows a degree of kind of inherent bias which um, may or may not exist in breadth. Um, but, you know, I think that that's evidence of a bias that he's got he, – he's – uh, advocating split routines at, at some level, whether it's you know uh, deliberate or not. Yeah, and 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 I do you know I know you um kind of um uh joked earlier about like oh this is an Instagram post like the you know the the wording's not going to be scientific, but I do you know this this image has been shared all over the web. Um, it's it's pretty popular, and I do think that uh, whilst it's got some good recommendations, um. I just think that the wording could have been tidied up a bit. Uh, maybe in this regard, it's like you say, due to um, a, a bias towards um, you know bodybuilders and the results they get, and using them as um, gui- for guidance, which we know to be really problematic. Um, but but yeah, in just some of these descriptions, I think they could have been tidied up um, a bit. But um, I guess I am being a bit bit harsh perhaps um okay so we, we kind of we kind of uh, agree on the training split that yeah full body uh, or split routines pretty much yield the same gains over time yeah yeah okay so what have we got here oh uh, this is an interesting one so periodization um and once we've done this one james if you've got time i'd love to hear just your basic uh, prescription or recommendations um so Periodization, having a plan is definitely more effective for building muscle than winging it. However, there is no single best way to periodize a program and many methods are successful at building muscle. Strategize, but allow for some flexibility based on how you feel day to day. Yeah, I mean, I, that's, I tend to agree with that. I don't think there's any periodized approach that works. You know, I've published a paper on that. Brad and, and co published a paper on that, uh, and they critiqued another paper on that as well. So periodization has become a buzzword again. Jeremy's taken periodization apart pretty well um, based on the literature, and I tend to agree. Um, I think that there is, there has to be a degree of how do we feel on any given day. Um, so, yeah, so strategize but allow for some flexibility. I think, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, I tend to plan my... Uh, week my training quite well ahead, advanced right now quite well ahead purely because I'm doing a big bike race in um, in April the end of April so I kind of keep looking ahead to make sure I'm getting enough miles in on the bike or all the all the miles that I want to whether that's enough or not we'll 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 find out further down the line um, um, whether I'm doing enough training other days or when I'm getting to lift weights, making sure I'm getting enough rest. So I think that strategizing is good uh, and being flexible with it is good. So, yeah, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a vague, again, another really kind of vague, um, paragraph. Um, and it doesn't really say much at all in my opinion. Um, <laughs> I, th- I think uh, people no, but I, I, well, I think it says what needs to be said. Actually, I think right. you know, strategize. You know, plan plan when you're going to train. So, if I said to you, when are you next going to train? You'd probably have a day or a date or a time in mind. You know, you'd say, well, I'm going to train Friday morning because I do this afterwards, or I do that, or I I'm going to train Friday afternoon because I'm going to fast until midday, and then I want to train, and then I'm going out for dinner or something. So you've already got a plan in mind. And if I mm. said to you, well, when are you going to train after that? You might say, well, Monday or Wednesday or whatever it might be. So most people have probably got that in mind. Um, but if you felt like crap, if you fell ill on Thursday night with food poisoning, you probably wouldn't get up and train on Friday morning. No. So I guess it's this periodization is again an ambiguous word because um, when you think of traditional periodization, you think of, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, people like uh, Brad Schoenfeld and a lot of his colleagues will talk about 
um, you know, deloading periods or un- was it, is it undulating or um, cycles yeah. and all of this type of thing where where is, they, they really are playing around with all of the variables, you know, like moving to higher rep ranges and moving to different loads for certain weeks. Like in, in high intensity training, it doesn't seem like we really, or most of us, uh, change that many variables, you know, when we, when we do periodize, if you want to call it that. No, no. And, and I think that there are two approaches to this. So the first off is from a high intensity training perspective, we would look at what they do and say, well, you're just fiddling with the minutia and right. it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter what rep range you work in. It doesn't really matter what you do with this, that, or the other, blah, blah, blah. And there's probably a degree of truth to that. And they would look back at us and say, you guys all do all the same workout all the time. And they would be right. And they would say, well, you're epitomizing the one size fits all. And that can't be true for everybody because of hormones and genetics and other stresses and so forth. And I would say there's probably a degree of truth to that. So somewhere in the middle, there has to be a balance of saying, well, we do high intensity training, but you know, now and then we want to add in some variety. So we want to do drop sets or we want to do um, you know, pre-exhaust, or we want to do more set, more exercises, or we want to do fewer exercises. Um, and to be honest, I, I think mentally that's probably far more important than it is physically. For optimizing hypertrophy, I don't think there's any difference. I think they can fiddle with all the variables as much as they want and get the same results, and we can stick to the same workout week in, week out, day in, day out, and get all the same results that they would. So I think that, you know, we're both splitting hairs, uh, the other variables are far more important, such as, you know, tempo or load or effort or, or frequency or whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, I, you know, I go in the gym some days and go, do you know what? I'm feeling I'm feeling good today. I'm going to uh, stick, I don't know, whatever kilos on the chest press. And other days I go in and go, do you know what? I'm not feeling it today. I'm going to put a lighter weight on there and I'm just going to I'm just going to try and get more reps. And I, I just like that variation. Mm. Yeah, you know, no. I, I was telling Luke, I was telling Luke a while back, I went through a phase of, of when I trained at a commercial gym of going in and making a point of never changing the pin on a weight stack. So I would always sit, that, sit down or whatever the last person did and do whatever weight they did. And it was quite interesting, actually, because you'd sit down and look at it and go, oh, my God, granny's been on this and she was lifting 10 pounds on a knee extension. What am I going to do? So I would do unilateral knee extensions for about 20 minutes. And then I would get to the chest press and go, well, you know, Bob, the bodybuilder has been on this one and he's got the weight stack on it. And if I get two reps out of that, I'll be happy. So I would do rest pause. You know, so you are, you know, and, that, and that's really nice to have that kind of variety, that kind of different mental stimulation, you know. Luke's guys will put people through different workouts where they do different advanced techniques and you know and so forth and that that's great. I love it. Yeah, I love that. Keep keep it coming. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's interesting, um, and I appreciate that. Uh, okay, so aware of time, James, but uh, if you've got a moment, I'd love for you to. I mean, I know obviously people can look at your paper um, you did with um, Dr. Steele and Dave Smith, I believe, called um, uh, well. It's, it's the hypertrophy recommendations, isn't it? Um, yeah. I can't remember the full name of the paper, which you published in 2013, and I'll link to that. Um, but I'd love to hear, you know, uh, just would you be able to just, for those that haven't read that, um, do you want to give your very kind of soundbite styled exercise prescription for maximal hypertrophy from your point of view? Uh, yeah, I don't know how, I mean, a lot of it is probably very similar to what we've just said actually which is why it's quite interesting to um to kind of look at it let me think um i'm sure i put i'm I'm actually just trying to find it so that i can make sure that i i i quote it verbatim i'd hate to say something and somebody say oh you didn't say that (laughs) so what so i was this is a far more scientific approach obviously but i said for for effort person should aim to recruit as many motor units in this muscle fibers as possible by training to momentary failure a uh, person should self-select a weight and perform repetitions to failure. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's heavier or lighter load. Rep duration, a uh, person should perform contractions at a rep duration that maintains muscular tension. Um, and then I commented that performing them too quickly might unload the muscle 
um, and apply momentum and hinder hypertrophic gain. But actually, uh, an explosive repetition might not be too bad. It might, for hypertrophy, it might have a higher risk of injury. And the argument I always say is if you throw away, you've got to catch it again afterwards. And that's probably the worst part. So I would say, keep muscular tension all the way through. That way, at least you know the muscle is doing the work, not momentum. Um, rest intervals we talked about, and I don't think it really applies because I don't think many people listening to this will do multiple sets. And if they do, then shame on you. Do single sets and do them, <laughs> pro- do single sets and do them properly. Rest interval between exercises. Take as long as you want or as long as your trainer allows you or as long as you feel appropriate. Um, single set training is fine. Don't be scared to take time off and have deep training periods. Um, you know, frequency is not, is not going to be the be all and end all. How hard you train is going to be a far bigger factor. Um, so if you need to take more time off to train harder, that's more important. Um, I put a comment in here, actually, participation in traditional endurance exercise doesn't hinder hypertrophic adaptations. And actually, I still stand by that. And I would say that actually even high intensity interval training like cycling or sprinting might even help hypertrophic adaptations. Um, we didn't touch on that. And the Brett, but there you go. Uh, range of motion doesn't seem to be as big a factor as um, as most people think. So if we want to move through a smaller range of motion, uh, for the safety of our joints and our posture and things like that, then that doesn't seem to be a big problem. Um, we should focus on both concentric, eccentric and isometric phases. Boy, I'm a really big one now. When I, the last time I did lateral raises, it was a four second concentric, 10 second pause and a four second eccentric. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I love the idea of throwing in some isometrics now and then. Uh, I think they're underrated. Um, and resistance type is up to the person based on their availability. Uh, you, in your email to me, said that I should comment on um, single sets to failure on poor equipment. Are they as effective as single sets to failure on medex equipment? Uh, by poor equipment, let's say that they don't have as good a strength curve, which means the exercise stops partway through the motion. Or let's say the friction is a lot higher. Well, what is friction? Friction is just resistance. So unfortunately, I'm going to say single sets to failure on poor equipment probably are just as effective for muscle hypertrophy as single sets to failure on medex equipment. Heresy, James. But I can tell you now, <laughs> you can drive from you can drive from here to Johnny Groats in a Ferrari, or you can drive from here to Johnny Groats in a Reliant Robin, and they both they might both get you to the same point, but you'll enjoy one a lot more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well so that. That's probably a fair analogy between poor equipment and medics equipment. <laughs> and, and, and let's be clear, medics is the Ferrari of resistance equipment. Um, yeah, so those, those would be my recommendations to people. Hopefully that was relatively that's, clear. <laughs> no, that's great. I, li- I like actually that you just summarize it like that because a lot of people probably haven't read the paper um, and would be very interested in hearing your kind of up-to-date thoughts on you know training for maximal hypertrophy um james thanks so much this has been a lot of fun um i've learned a lot and um i'm i'm i hope that i'm I'm sure the listeners have enjoyed it too um what's the best way if you were to find out more about you yeah people can just send me an email it's james.fisher at solent.ac.uk um yeah, and I do my best to reply to all the emails I get. Uh, you can probably find me on Twitter. Uh, I think it's at JP Fisher UK. Um, same on Instagram, or you can probably find me on Facebook. Um, I don't really use Instagram, and I seldom update my Twitter or seldom tweet. Um, but, um, yeah, just send me an email, and I'll do the best I can. A few people have started emailing me, which is really nice to hear, and hopefully I've replied to them all. And, uh, yeah. Good. Well, you know, rather than get inundated, James, with emails from people about more questions about hypertrophy, um, I think we'll be efficient would be uh, if you want to go to the blog post for this episode, which will be over at corporatewarrior.co forward slash hypertrophy update. Um, and, you know, we will take those comments that are left there as well as the comments on social media to structure the questions for part two. Um, so that might be a better way of doing it. 
Um, so, and for all episodes, please also go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash podcast. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. Discover how to improve health, become a great personal trainer, and build a successful high-intensity strength training business. Check out CorporateWarrior.co. CorporateWarrior.co.